All right. I, I think it is probably time to formally kick off the webinar. It is five minutes past the top of the hour. So thanks, everybody, for joining in for that um, really terrible uh, pre-webinar banter. Welcome to Spectrum Analysis in Industrial Environments with MetaGeek and GPA. We'll learn a little bit more about GPA here in just a minute, but we're really excited about this webinar. Uh, we've got a special guest with us today, Scott McNeil. Um, oh, there goes my camera. It'll be back. It does that. It doesn't matter though, because I wanted you to look at Scott anyway. So it was really good timing. <laughs> Don't look at me. Don't look at me. <laughs> Scott, how, what would you describe yourself as? I put down industrial Wi-Fi guy, or did you put that down when we built these slides? I don't remember, but I put that in there. That's just kind of my, my, my self-made little moniker because All right. you know, I had to differentiate myself and I thought that was kind of cool and my own little geeky way. And so I just kind of kept it. Awesome. Uh, can you can you give us a really quick introduction about I don't know your company, what GPA does, what your specialties are, things like that? Sure. Uh, I work for GPA Global Process Automation. We uh, we are um, industrial um, automation integrators. So you know, two thirds of our engineers are guys who do all the programming on uh, like PLCs and distributed control systems and SCADA systems and. So these are the guys who program things that make robot arms work and move, that make uh, valves open and close and have the uh, lo have lo logical stuff that has real world impact. Um, I am on the OT team. So I do industrial network uh, infrastructure and um, I am one of the few uh, industrial infrastructure people who actually uh, does a lot of work in wireless. Uh, it's a very small niche. There's not a lot of us out there who regularly work in industrial environments. Um, as, as I have discovered, which is why I, I started my blog and whatnot, is to, to try and start building a community of those of us who work a lot in the industrial environment, industrial manufacturing. Um, so I go into a lot of different cool places. Um, <clears throat> uh, we do a lot of work in pulp and paper. Um, uh, we do some work in oil and gas, pharma, uh, a lot of chemical companies as well, you know, not so much your huge, giant, shining car manufacturers and stuff, because they are they 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 have the the funds to support their own full time teams to do all this stuff. Uh, we go into a lot of small to mid size and some law and some larger manufacturing um, that doesn't have the perpetual resources to do this on their own. Um, and with the advent of wireless just be blowing up over the past 15, 20 years, it's really starting to make its way into the manufacturing environment not only for just uh, wireless access, but all of your industrial IoT um, applications as well. And, you know, it's not all, the big thing, especially in industrial environments is it's not all 802.11. There is so much out there that does not run on um, 802.11 standards, which is what makes spectrum analysis so important because that's the only way you're gonna be able to see and troubleshoot their signals. Um, you can't do sit there and do a wireless uh, packet capture on something that's not uh, not of the standard. So you you have to go with what what you've got. So um, what we have is spectrum analysis. So that's one of my biggest tools that I use when I'm out in the field uh, because then I at least get a really good picture of the raw RF that's going on and can work from there. Awesome. Thanks for that introduction, Scott. Really appreciate it. Um, I also want to uh, give Casey a chance to introduce himself. Casey, you want to say hey really quick? Yes. I'll probably uh, see me before, but uh, you know, I'm just the uh, the frontline support guy and just here to kind of facilitate the chat. But Joel, it sounds like you uh, you have that. Handled. You said just the frontline support guy. As if... <laughs> Kate, Casey and I work together a lot on product management stuff. Uh, he finds me PCAP files at Crash IPA and finds tons of bugs. So Casey does uh, does a little bit of everything at MetaGeek. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you've ever opened up a support ticket at uh, MetaGeek, I'm sure you've talked to Casey. So uh, so Casey's going to, I don't know, he's going to hang out. And uh, and if somebody puts a good question in the Q&A, he's going to bring that up and, and stuff there. So, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit in just a second. But real quick, my name's Joel. I'm the product owner here at, uh, at MetaGeek. And so uh, Casey sends me bugs and I decide what order the bugs get fixed in. That's mostly what I do. So um, so it's pretty fun. Uh, real quick, just so that we kind of know what to expect throughout this webinar. First off, I should have put chaos up here at the top. So expect chaos. Oh, I can't even spell chaos correctly, but I'm not even going to try. Um, expect some chaos, uh, especially because we have uh, Jim Palmer here on the phone as well. Uh, Jim, you can wave if you want. Uh, Jim did a, a webinar with our friends at Ekahau last week about spectrum analysis. And so he's, he's really experienced in this whole uh, spectrum analysis webinar thing. I've heard. I heard he knows everything. 
Me and UC are going to contribute like a mother. <laughs> is UC even still here? Last I checked, he was washing his car while he was on the Zoom. So we'll, the dryer's we'll... pretty loud, so he probably had to mute. <laughs> but I mean, washing his car, sitting at a desk, I mean, is there any difference? Not really. Not there really. You go. So a couple housekeeping housekeeping things. First off, the webinar is being recorded. So if you want to subject yourself to this again, uh, there's a shot of UC inside his car. Hey, you see, he just waved. If you want to subject yourself to this again, we will be posting it to our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, probably take us a couple of days to get it posted there, but keep an eye out for that. Also, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please use the Q&A tool. There's a dedicated Q&A tool that you can open up in Zoom. And uh, not only can you ask questions, but you can also upvote other people's questions. So if you have a question, put it in there. If you put it in the chat, there's a good chance that we'll miss it. So use the Q&A tool. That'll guarantee that we get to it. Uh, speaking of the chat, please feel free to use it. Uh, if you change the two to panelists and attendees, that will send your chat to everyone that's on the webinar. It's about 170 of us here on the webinar. So maybe some good conversations will come out of it. So please feel free to use that. We will keep an eye on the chat, but if you have a question, then definitely do use the Q&A tool to make sure that we get it, uh, uh, that we, that we get it in there. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start out with a quick spectrum analysis primer. I'm going to spend like three, four minutes. Just if you've never looked at a spectrum analyzer before, I want to give you a super quick, uh, uh, crash course in what you're looking at. And then what we're going to do is Scott is going to show us some boring sources of interference that he found. And then he's going to show us some more exciting sources of interference that he found. And then we're going to end on the extremely exciting interferers. Yeah, I like he's doing the whole mind blown thing. And then um, we'll probably answer some questions along the way. If Casey sees a good question, he'll let us know and we'll stop and answer those. Uh, but we'll also do a dedicated Q&A uh, time at the end. And we will try to end on time, something that UC is not capable of doing. Uh, but I, I actually have been known to end webinars on time before. So we're going to try for that. We'll see, uh, we'll see how things go. Okay, really, really quick. Let's do a super duper fast uh, introduction to spectrum analysis, just in case you've never seen a spectrum analyzer before. So, you know, this is a great time for Jim to go, you know, grab another Coke or, or whatever. So, um so the first thing I want to talk about is this view right here, which we call the density view. This is present in most spectrum analyzers out there, but it shows us basically three main things. I'm going to talk about two of them on this slide and then one thing on the next slide, and then we'll get into the actual stuff uh, from Scott. Uh, frequency and amplitude show us where things are happening and how loud they are happening. So if you look at the height of the graph, you can see there's a thing right here. In this case, this is an old 2.4 gigahertz cordless phone. I think Casey has it these days that we keep around at Medigeek because it's great for demos. It's really, really good for, for showing what a spectrum analyzer does when you turn on an old 2.4 gigahertz cordless phone. But we can see that there is a thing here and the height of that thing tells us the amplitude or signal strength. Basically, how loud is it? The taller that shape gets, the closer you are to it. If you see it get really tall like that, you are right next to it. If it's really far down here, kind of like that, eh, that means that you're not very close by and you might need to, need to walk around a little bit to try to track that thing down. The next thing that we can see is where is it in the band? Is it down here by Wi-Fi channel one? Is it up here by Wi-Fi channel 11? What channel or frequency is this device on? And that, and we can tell based on where it is by looking at the left or the right on the, on the graph. Then the next thing is utilization. It shows how often something is talking. Now, anybody that's worked in Wi-Fi for, for any period of time knows that Wi-Fi is half duplex. Only one thing can transmit on a channel at a time. So understanding how busy a channel is is really, really important. And the utilization shows us how often a channel or frequency space is being utilized. So we do that with color. So if you see blue, like this shape right here, this is actually an 802.11b uh, access point right here talking to a client, but it's not talking very often. Blue means that it's using that frequency space less than 10% of the time. So it's really not generating a whole lot of traffic. Whereas if you see red, red indicates that it's using that channel or frequency space 50% of the time or more. So red means it's talking a lot. Blue means it's not talking very much. It's not quite uh, as, uh, as big of a deal. Uh, and then, oh, I guess there is one more slide. I thought that was last one. I do have one more. One thing that I personally like to do is I like to start with the physical layer. I kind of think of a spectrum analyzer as a cable tester. It's kind of like, uh, like I have a, 
a, a net ally link sprinter. I know that they're like our sworn enemies and that we're competitors and all that, but I love that tool. It is a fantastic little tool. You plug it in, it checks for layer one connectivity, tries to get an IP address, tries to get to the internet. It is fantastic for validating cables. Really, really enjoy that little device. That's kind of what a spectrum analyzer is. It's the cable tester of Wi-Fi. So one thing that I like to do is I'll fire up a spectrum analyzer and look and see, is that where the problem is? And then I start working up the layers of the OSI model. And so, uh, for example, if I see a non-Wi-Fi signature like this cordless phone, then I go, oh, yeah, okay, there's a non-Wi-Fi interferer here, and I'll use spectrum analysis to identify and remove that non-Wi-Fi interference or, or maybe work around it, depending on the situation. I think Scott will talk a little bit more about that. But if I see a Wi-Fi signature there, this is what 802.11G and if we were up in the five gigahertz band, this is what 802.11AC looks like. That's Wi-Fi. There is no non-Wi-Fi interference here. And so that's what I'm going to start to look at some other tools uh, to, solve, to solve the issue because there's no non-Wi-Fi interference causing an issue here. So with that, I believe it is now time for Scott. This is the part of the webinar where Scott shows examples and stuff. So Scott, I am going to unshare my screen and pass it okay. over to you. You ready? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you took a lot of time to put that together. Oh, all kinds of time. Yeah, that took yeah. me 30, I think it was like, like, I think it took me 30 seconds to go find the slides I'd already made way back in the day. And one of those is a slide Casey had made. So yeah, it took me about 30 seconds to find those slides. You're, you're very welcome, by the way, for that. Oh, what are you guys seeing? Did I share the right one? I can see Channelizer, yeah. Okay, all right, it's my, uh... Stuff's transferring screens on me. All right, there we go. Um, so typically when I go into a, a, a site and I, and, I, and I break open Channelizer, um, one of the first things I check is, is five gigahertz because I just wanna see what's going on there. Usually five gigahertz is pretty clean. And this is just kind of, I'm just gonna go ahead and stretch it out here. This is essentially what I usually see in five gig. Um, I would say uh, more often than not, I recommend um, at, at industrial manufacturing sites to, to start moving towards five gig. There's so much more space. Um, eventually, uh, um, you know, six gig with Wi-Fi six and whatnot um, will we'll have a lot of flexibility as well. But that also depends on the environment because so many of these places, it's all heavy machinery, it's all metal. The higher that frequency, the more reflectivity you're gonna get. Um, and so then you can get all sorts of hidden problems going on which uh, take a lot longer to discern and, and figure out. But, you know, I, I like seeing a good clean um, uh, five gig space. So I know what I, I've got to work with. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, there's not a lot of crazy stuff that goes on in, in five gig. Uh, but sometimes I do see some weird stuff. Um, and in this particular site, I had, if you can see way over here, this narrow band five gigahertz uh, transmission that, um, and this was at a converting facility that, that takes gigantic rolls of paper and then turns them into other products like napkins or toilet paper or paper towels and whatnot. Um, and their, their, their back warehouse section um, where I, I, I got this grab, I, I got this narrow band five, and it was just constant. It was just consistent all the way through. When you shrink down, it's kind of cool because when you look at it, you see it, it's almost like it's doing a, a, a frequency hopping kind of pattern back and forth, um, but it's still staying narrow band. It's just hop, 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 hop. Um, some of the guys thought it may have been associated with some of their automated lighting. I wasn't quite sure, but in five gig, I had never seen something like this before. So I, uh, five gigahertz because of its channel breadth and, and uh, different capabilities, I don't see a whole lot of interferers there. Um, so this is one of the few interesting things in five gig that I've seen. Um, I don't know, Jim, have you seen a lot in the way of, of five gig narrowband transmissions? Not really, no. Um, I, uh, I was talking to a friend in the UK um, about three weeks ago, and uh, I think it's okay to say who it is. Peter, Peter McKenzie. Some of you people know who Peter McKenzie is. Uh, he said that he's actually starting, and this is going to make it sound like I'm trying to sell more Wi-Fi DVXs. I mean, I'm always trying to do that, to be fair. But 
Uh, he said that lately he's actually seeing more and more up in the five gigahertz band. Uh, he's starting to see lighting controls, especially uh, like passive infrared um, uh, little monitors that sit in the corner, the, like up on the wall in the corner. So little PIR devices are starting to do some stuff in the five gigahertz band. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually seeing a lot of lighting control in five gig. Uh, mm. But usually it, it's it's such short burst stuff. The, the only real... Uh, activity you ever see is maybe it, it starts raising the noise floor a little bit, but that's about mm -hmm. it. Um, now, Scott, in this particular environment, it, was it causing a problem? I mean, it looks like it's way up there. It just was, affecting. It was not. Um, yeah. What, what Wi-Fi traffic there was, was down in the lower channels anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to kick on the, the, the network's table because, you know, S, SSIDs and proprietary and all that stuff. Um, keep the, the, the location uh, anonymous. Yeah. Um, but they, they did have some five gigahertz traffic, but it was all in the lower channels. So probably I'm, I'm taking some stabs at this based on sure. little shapes that I'm seeing in the spectrum. Um, I think there actually was a question about this, like what does Wi-Fi look like? Um, and maybe I'll show you one of the slides a, a little bit uh, later on. We can bounce back to one of those. Absolutely. But I'm typically looking for kind of like squares like this. That's that's a good sign that there's Wi-Fi. But really, if you just turn on and you're not going to do this to protect your customer here, but if you use the networks graph here, we'll actually just show you where the networks are and it's easy to make those correlations. Yeah. And you can you can see some of the Wi-Fi traffic there in the higher channels, but this narrow band did not seem to be interfering with with any of the activity at all. So I just thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and then I was out at... Um, a wood yard in a, in a paper mill. And at this particular location, this is, let me see if I can find a picture and I'll, I'll actually show you guys where I was. Uh, while you're finding that picture, do you mind if I answer a couple of questions? Will that take the-, the Absolutely, the go ahead. <laughs> All right, awesome. Uh, oh, there was one that I saw that was, uh, that was really good. Okay, Matt Harding has an excellent question here. He says, what problems with your analysis of interference are caused by the fact that the spectrum analyzer is a scanner and thus there are various artifacts that can muddy the water when interpreting spectral signatures that you see? Matt, I think I understand the question that you're asking here. Uh, so there are a, a couple of things that can happen. First off, if you're running a Wi-Fi scanner while you're doing spectrum analysis, if I remember correctly, Casey, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but if I remember correctly, Windows will send some probe requests to try to, to listen for, for APs that'll hear. Uh, Jim is nodding his head, so I think I'm correct on that. Am I correct on that, Jim? That it'll send some probe requests, do you remember? I think it will. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's all about, because it is just, it's, a, it's an application really. And being able to control that computer, Nick, and putting it into you know monitor mode or you know where it's, it's basically shut down and only listening is a little bit tougher on Windows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, that, you know, it, it will send a frame every now and then to say, Hey, is anybody here? My opinion though, that it doesn't really show up on a spectrum analyzer. And so uh, it's pretty easy to pick out the stuff that, that matters, you know, the, the narrow band interferes, the things like that. So cool. Scott, you ready to go? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I was in this wood yard and this is uh, what is referred to as a stacker reclaimer setup. Um, and what you have here are just these massive mounds of wood chips. Um, and these one set of uh, giant boom arms stack it up um, to either side. And then these reclaimers then go and start pulling all of the wood chips in in a measured uh, uh, fashion um, for the, uh, into the, the system so the creation of paper can, can move forward. Sometimes the, the chips are used for power. Sometimes the chips are actually moved into the, the paper making process. So anyway, with this project, we are connecting up um, both reclaimers and both stackers into the system wirelessly. So I had to get out there and do some spectrum analysis to make sure we didn't have any monkey wrenches being thrown around us. And so I was actually standing right down here in between these monsters uh, and I didn't really pick up anything on the Wi-Fi itself, but I got this odd signature down here in the, in the bottom channels. Uh, they didn't have any active Wi-Fi uh, out there. Um, and after talking to a few others, uh, any, any five gig that they were broadcasting um, was in other buildings uh, fairly far away. 
I did find out later that they had some ubiquity cameras out there in the wood yard and that they were indeed five gigahertz. And so in relation to where I was standing, as it turns out, I was standing right next to one of the cameras. And uh, so I'm, I'm this little squared off section here. Um, I am, um, my confidence level is, is 95, 98% that that was those ubiquity cameras because they were the only active thing out there in the wood yard. Now were those, Wi-Fi or 802.11 cameras, or were they just a, or were they using their own thing to talk? Do you remember? Uh, I believe they were, they were older ubiquity cameras, like some of their first gen. So I don't, I'm not hundred percent that they were 802.11. They, they, a lot of the ubiquity stuff is, is um, integratable with all, all of itself, you know, that whole e ubiquity ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it very well could be, but it's not throwing the signatures that, that match up for 802.11. Yeah. And Cause I, it, um, and you know, nothing showed up in the network table um, as far as claiming that e even as a, as a hidden SSID or anything. So that that's why I was on the fence. And its signature doesn't look like it either. Yeah. I mean, if it was restricted to just this 36 th channel 36 with 20 megahertz wide bandwidth, I would say, yep, that's Wi-Fi. But the but fact that it stretches further, further south. Yeah. Be. I'm with you. That does not look like 802.11. So, uh, and again, you know, uh, I don't really find a whole lot of odd stuff in, in five gigahertz in general. Um, but that's, that's about the most exciting thing. You know, this is, this is the boring interferers uh, section. So, you know, it's all nice and pretty and clean out this way and just a little bit of could be exciting, but probably not down here in the corner, but here, cool. uh, yeah. So here recently though, um, about, um, about, Nine, 10 months ago, I finally got a hold of a uh, Y-Spy 900. Um, and, you know, because I don't know who decided to not make them anymore, but uh, with so much uh, 900 megahertz being used in the industrial sector for so many different things, you know, it's used for sensor networks. It's used for um, industrial controls and uh, remote I/O. Uh, remote I/O being remote input output for um, mechanical devices. Um, it's not necessarily for for our data throughput. You know, it's a, a lower frequency, but you can actually get you know up to up to 10, 12 meg across it if you have it set up properly. Um, but that also gains you a lot of distance. You know, 900 megahertz has become my obsession over the past year. And so I finally was able to get a hold of uh, a 900X and from eBay, eBay, Joel, eBay. I know, I'm listening, I know. Um, and so it was used from eBay, not from proper channels. Uh, who knows where this poor thing has been? What do you think, Casey? Should we cut him off? Should we just kick him off and finish the webinar by, by ourselves? Let's do it. <laughs> Okay, we'll let him. We'll let him go a little. Maybe he'll redeem himself. Let's see what happens here. Uh, so, uh, this was one of my first times actually getting a 900 megahertz capture and seeing um, some 900 megahertz traffic in action. So, this particular recording are some uh, banner uh, 900 megahertz uh, radios, um, and these guys we were running some tests out of out of a wait a wastewater treatment facility. Easy for you to say. Um, and we put them in test mode to start passing some traffic. And these guys are not 802.11, but they do use uh, frequency hopping. And that was, which is really great because you can see, literally see the, the frequency hopping in action. And you can see where they, they fired up and made their connection. Um, and then it starts moving into their actual uh, data throughput testing um, for the connectivity. And then when the test stopped, you could see where the connection um, uh, dismantled itself, and it was it was good for me because with all of uh, the 900 megahertz that's out there, I'm trying to get more familiar with its signatures, and so getting this right off the bat, um, a nice, good, clean picture of of uh, what um, frequency hopping in 900 looks like was was uh, to me exciting because I'm a total geek for this stuff. Um, but also important uh, as a learning aspect because I'm getting out there and I'm doing more and more. And 
you know, the, the more I've, I've pushed out, the more people are reaching back out to me to come and get and check their systems. And I want to know exactly what I'm looking for while I'm out there. So Scott, I have a question about this, uh, this graph, the visualization that we're looking at right sure. now. Um, and it's going to be a really soft, it's going to be a super easy question. Um, what does the color tell us about how often this device is using this frequency space? Like, what does it tell us? Oh, it, it's hardly at all. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's, but you also have to remember that um, other than these tests, these devices are only communicating uh, at, at intervals. You know, a lot of these are battery pack in, uh, devices. So it could be every 30 seconds. It could be every five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and the few times that you actually do get a full transmission, an extended transmission, you'll see that um, they are, let me kick the view on here. Um, and I, you'll see it in some of these others that their actual transmissions are narrow band and you're, you're sitting right on, on a single uh, channel and they're not spreading out across the spectrum. I'm so like, these you know, are like one megahertz wide, one megahertz yeah. wide. Yeah. I think you still say megahertz, but yeah, they're super duper narrow compared to Wi-Fi. Yep. Let's see. Let's look at the second test. So this was a, an extended test that ran a little longer. And then we left them connected up. But if you shrink it down, let's see. You can actually see the little nubs of their uh, barely touching anything. Because you figure this is a, this is right there. That's, that's a, a 10, 15 second time frame, And it's just hopping right across. And, it, and it's barely doing anything to the spectrum at all. So it, it's nice to see that even though you're getting all the communications you need, you're not all, you're not dirtying up the airwaves. You're, you're not creating interference issues for, uh, for other items. But again, you, you get to see that uh, all this test activity. And then when the test was finished, all you see of the, what's left over here on the, on the left side is just its baseline uh, connectivity traffic. You know, that's really interesting. And it reminds me of, a an image i saw um at some briefing i was at where they actually turned off the all the ap's in a facility one time just to see what would happen and they were looking at the spectrum and all of a sudden you just saw all these clients start to probe and you could see how much and it, but it was the exact same thing as they sort of probed across all the channels looking for you're know, trying to find ssids and it's, it's just interesting that this type of behavior we're seeing it at 900 you know but you can also see that type of thing at 2.4 and 5 gig and Wi-Fi. It's just, you know, instead of being a one megahertz wide, you know, channel, it's 20 megahertz. But it's, right. it, it's, it's interesting to, to see that they kind of behave this, the same way, even though they're totally different technologies. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not 82.11 and whatnot, but it's still uh, frequency hopping. I mean, you know, frequent, it, frequency hopping is frequency hopping, you know. Um, I don't know of any other way to, to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not. But it's, it's just, it, it's, I just... I found that fascinating. So thanks for sharing that. Oh yeah, man. Uh, like, like I said, I totally geek out with all this stuff and I really enjoy the, vis the visible aspect of it because it helps my brain understand what's really going on. Um, so being able to see it on a spec and just makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it, it, it for understanding? Oh, man, it, it, it totally does. Um, so then let me, um, I need to find another picture real quick, Jill, if you want to fill sure. the question right quick. Yeah, yeah, we can, we, can do, uh, uh, we can do another question here. Casey, do you, do you have a question uh, uh, that you think stands out here? Well, we had a Wi-Fi 6 question at the uh, beginning that I was going to see if maybe uh, you could answer. Which one? Was well, that the one by Hunter? It's from Hunter, yeah. Yeah, from yeah. Hunter. Does Wi-Fi 6 reduce spectrum interference due to its faster throughput speeds? Jim, Jim laughs. At me. He's laughing at me because he. I was going to type an answer to this, and I was like, "There's no way I'm going to try to type this." So it, it's it's a bit of a tricky one. So tell you what, Jim, I'll take a crack at it while while Scott's getting everything queued up for his next uh, for his next stuff here. Um, so remember that data rate data rate defines how it data rate influences how long a device will stay on the air, right? If it has to talk at a low data rate, it's going to be a long drawn out answer or a long drawn out transmission, like one megabit per second will just take a very long time. 
Wi-Fi 6 does introduce some very fast data rates. I, the, the MCS table, if you go to mcsindex.com and you look at all the possible data rates with Wi-Fi 6, it's kind of nutty. So yes, the faster a device gets on the air and off the air with a faster data rate, the less utilization it will cause in the spectrum. But there's no guarantee that there's not going to be a ton more data to send, right? And so at the end of the day, I think that uh, applications get more complex. They need to send more data. And so I don't think that we're seeing airtime savings overall. We're really just keeping up at this point is what we're doing. So what do you think, Jim? Is that anywhere close? Well, but do you consider a Wi-Fi 6 being, I mean, if, if it's an actual 802.11 signal, is that really interference or is it just a signal like Scott was talking about, I mean, like we were talking about earlier, and you or you were talking about earlier, you know, so from an interference perspective, interference is, is something that is, that is on this spectrum in that chunk of space that isn't conducive or isn't good to the, to the protocol. And so it doesn't have anything to do with speeds because it's a, it's two separate conversations. Yeah. So Wi-Fi six, you know, if, and Keith, Thank you for joining us today. Keith loves to say that Wi-Fi, you know, causes more, you know, congestion and more things, you know, problems to your signal than any other non-Wi-Fi thing. And so where we get with Wi-Fi 6 is the fact that because, or not, well, 6 and then 6E, and the 6 gigahertz stuff. I mean, it's just, you know, additional spectrum that we can then go in and mess up and run 320 megahertz wide channels and for no reason and just... <laughs> And cause problems. So it so the speed, you know, and and OFDM and OFDMA and MCS fourteen or whatever we're at now. I mean, that speed doesn't really interference is still going to be interference. And if somebody, if an incumbent on a Wi-Fi six E channel and a six gigahertz pops up, you know, that might be interference because it's not AO two dot eleven. And so, but we're going to have to back off on that one. So, you know, incumbents and other things, I mean, interference is interference and it can come up in any way. And back to the IoT question from earlier, why are we so shocked that lighting controllers are starting to come into five gigahertz? Because we've been complaining for how many decades or years that 2.4 is dead, 2.4 is dead. And why doesn't IoT have good chipsets? And why can't we go into five gigahertz? And now we go into five gigahertz and everybody's like, well, wait why a second. Now we're seeing, I oh, no. we're seeing IoT point. in five gigahertz. How did that happen? And I'm like, that's what we asked for. <laughs> So, all right, my soapbox is done. I'll, I'll go back on mute. So much for your five gigahertz safe space. <laughs> we saw enough for you there, Scott. You ready oh, to go? Oh, yeah, perfect. Um, you know, I wanted to bring up this one um, real quick. And this was, I was uh, here in my garage office, my garage office that now looks like a warehouse because we're packing up and getting ready to move into our new house. Um, I was working on some Phoenix contact radios. Now, these are industrial radios that are DIN rail mount. Um, and these are 900 megahertz. But the reason I wanted to bring this up, I was, I was teaching my daughter how to hook these up. And, and this was her first run um, at running some uh, spectrum analysis so she could kind of see what was going on because she didn't understand how you could see what was going on in the air. It was all invisible. But, you know, we let, we hooked these up and we let them run. And I, the reason I bring this up is these are, these are also not 802.11, but these are frequency hopping but you can see the complete difference on how they do their frequency hopping. Um, so while it, it's, uh, again, it, it's the same principle, uh, but it has a completely different pattern and uh, it shows up differently in, in the spectrum analyzer, which to me fascinates me that you're doing essentially the same thing, but it looks so different, but you can still see your, your nice striped patterns going across mm -hmm. as it's hopping uh, through the, the different frequencies. But it, the difference here is you're actually getting a little spike of activity on this channel just uh, right there at 912, and that's the control traffic. So that's the coordinating control traffic of uh, as it's sitting there, as these two radios are um, skipping across the 900 frequency to, to communicate to one another. So I just thought that was to kind of add to what uh, Jim was saying earlier um, uh, of just how uh, similar these things are, but how different they are. Um, and again, it's, it's good to know to see these things out there so that when you, um, when you go on site and you're asked to, uh, to uh, uh, check it out and you're asked to give them a report back of what's going on, when you see these things, you're able to give them a, a definite answer. 
So the other day, um, I was uh, actually uh, doing, and you and some people, some somebody may have, you guys may have seen this on uh, on uh, LinkedIn or or on um, on uh, Twitter. But I was up on top of a crane doing some spectrum analysis. So I get to I get to go to some cool places. So, you know, I was, I was 100 feet up in the air uh, on top of this massive uh, crane that goes back and forth. And I was doing some 900 megahertz spectrum analysis because they had some links up there and that I was up there checking out. And I was like, well, while I'm here, um, I wanted to go ahead and get some grabs across the, uh, uh, across the gambit. Um, and so I started uh, with this one. I seen, I had, I ran across something I had never seen before. Um, so we get in and they have some 900 megahertz radios that are up there communicating back and forth. And they are um, these narrow bands right here on 911 and 921, because this is actually um, a, a, a data link. So they are actually reaching across this. They're getting about, about 10 megabits worth of throughput um, with these, these uh, two transmission points. And so while I was getting the test, uh, beginning of the test, they started testing some of the new drives that they had put in up at the top of the crane. Um, and they fired up one single drive and it just exploded. Ooh. And to, uh, this was, this was their, their minute test of a new drive that they had just installed. They had, they had installed four of them. Um, and I had never seen this kind of, uh, interference in 900 megahertz before I'm sure exists, you know, obviously I, I didn't think it was some sort of unicorn fantasy, but this was the, the first time I had ever really run across this. And exactly. You can see it just shoots the noise floor way up. Um, and I just, I actually just finished the analysis report for this last night. Um, so that if they ever start, uh, reporting trouble with that communications link for the, the maintenance group. I'm pretty sure I know it's the new drives they put in. Um, so I just happened to be at the right place at the right time uh, to catch when they were the, testing one of the single drives and was able to capture it. Hey, Scott, can you do me a favor and can you move your time span away from that uh, noise floor? I'd, I'd like to Absolutely. take a moment to illustrate. So grab the bottom one and move it up too so that we're just completely not looking okay. at that noise floor okay. anymore. Um, so, so when the, no the noise floor is there, it's just down below the sensitivity of the spec and and what we care about. So you just can't see it, but it is down there. And so what we get here is that this, I would assume, is our signal strength, right, from that device. Yep. And so, so the I, difference- I was right on top of it. Though, you know, the yeah. antennas were, were like 10 feet away from it. Right there. Yeah, which is a good perspective to look from because you're getting the perspective of the receiver slash or transmitter, I guess. Oh, exactly. So, yeah. Um, so what we get here is that we, we, if we look at the difference between the signal strength and the noise floor, that gives us the SNR, right? The signal to noise ratio, um, which is going to look at like what? 37-ish dB. Am I doing my math right there? Yeah. It's around 37-ish. Yeah. So then if we move back to, if you move the time span back down to look at that, uh, at when those motors came on, look at what happens to our SNR. <laughs> I mean, it drops by, by 15 points. Yeah. You know, um, at least, and, and so that that makes it. Now, granted, narrowband transmissions do tend to have a knack of of punching through this stuff. Yeah. Um, but still, I mean, that's that's quite a challenge. Uh, and, and if they're um, they're not set up right on the other end, uh, then this could really cause a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, this was my first experience of of any sort of major interfere um in 900 meg and i was really glad i was able to capture this uh because th this was a a big learning experience for me there too but so it was that nice because as soon as i walked over and talked to the other couple engineers i said what did you guys just do and he was able to tell me well i just with this new drive we installed i just cut it on let it run for about a minute uh and then cut it off and i was like no really awesome uh well i i caught that and uh so that, that was one of those nice things of being in the right place at the right time so nice. So that's what we call EMI. I mean that. Yes, absolutely. This is raw, unfiltered uh, EMI coming yep. off of those drives. Yep. Boom, just like that, right? It, Electromagnetic it's, it's interference. It's absolutely crazy. Um, 
So moving right along, we will move into everybody's favorite 2.4. So let's just go into everybody blowing up 2.4. So let me pull this up. Let me see which one this is. Okay. So this is, this was an interesting scenario. Let me change this over to channels. This was an interesting scenario. This, the, the same place that I saw that narrow band five gigahertz at, when I was over um, around their converting machines um, and I was getting captures there, obviously you can see there's some really heavy traffic going on, um, you know, in, in 2.4, but the kicker is, is look what channel it's in. It's in 14. So as of right now, to the best of my knowledge, 14 is still not usable in the United States. Matter of fact, uh, what is it? It's like Japan is where it's the only legal uh, uh, us usable uh, channel there. Um, and I was like, well, what's going on here? So we started playing the runaround game, um, trying to find the, the, the source of this. And, you know, I let them know the fact that, um, you know, according to the FCC, you're not supposed to be using channel 14. So whatever device that you've got in there, that could get you into some serious trouble. And you, if, if you got caught, you could be looking at, at some, some fairly large fines um, and then have to mitigate that. Uh, it took some time, but we were finally able to find the source. And what these were, were these were some... Um, from a manufacturer called Crosby. These were Crosby straight point radios and they were radio dongles that were used for wireless communication for, and, and in this particular application was for scales. So they were bringing up, uh, they would they would pallet up their material, drop it on these scales, get the weight that told them how much material they had, then the fork truck pick it up and run off with it. And, but apparently there's a whole lot of overhead uh, in these. And so we started digging into all of the paperwork um, that was associated with these guys. And again, these were USB dongles, which blew my mind. Um, but as we started digging into the documentation, their default channels are 14 and 15. Um, and I was like, how can they even sell these in the US? Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and after further investigation, they apparently have um, uh, an FCC exemption to be able to run in those channels. Uh, according to their documentation. Now, the actual validity of that remains to be seen because I wasn't going to go poke that bear because I didn't want these clients to go have to deal with, you know, a, a conceivable FCC violation. But according to the, the Crosby documentation that I was able to find for those particular radios, uh, they actually had that exception. So I thought this was really unusual because I have never seen that much traffic in 14 that was actual radio traffic that wasn't sort of any sort of uh, EMI or ambient interference. Uh, Scott, a couple uh, from the from the chat. I'm I'm starting to get nervous. We only have 13 minutes left, and I, I said that I would out UC UC here. Maybe out UCing UC is to go longer with the webinar than he normally does. Okay, Maybe that's do what that, that means. I'm not scared. Um, so a couple things. I'm scrolling back to remember what was said here in the chat. Um, David said, "Sounds like Japanese kit." Um, was it? Did it end up being Japanese equipment in the end, or was it non? No, or no, was, that was the thing. It was not Japanese. Okay. No, uh, the other thing too, William said, uh, Japan only allowed 802.11b in channel 14. They no longer use 14 for that. I, I did not know that. I, I, did, I thought they were still using it. If you look at this signature, it actually, if it's a, that was, I'm glad he brought that up because it actually is 802.11b. Okay. That's funny though, because the curve shape tells me it's 802.11b because that's what yep. that's what DSSS DSSS looks like. Um, but if it's a square shape that tells you it's OFDM, it's a little bit of both, oh, which oh. makes me think there's a bit of OFDM in there. So not only is it wrong, it's double wrong. Right. Right. And so what I was thinking is this may just be actual, uh, like uh, someone else said it, this may actually be Japanese kit that was then rebranded, got an exemption and sold it here in the States. And somebody you know, didn't check all the things. Right. You know, uh, it was just, it was, it was odd, to, especially when you look at their documentation and it just stated plain that their default channels were 14 and 15. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that was pretty interesting. I know we're starting to run short on time, but the good stuff is, is coming up. Um, let's see here. Let's pull up. 
time flies and you're having fun. It, it does, you know, and I, I tend to yammer a little bit. Um, <laughs> I don't mean to. Let's take another question while you're working on pulling up the next, uh, the, the next one. <laughs> Rick says, LOL. <laughs> um, we're, I don't know if that's what he was laughing at or not. Uh, by the way, everybody in the chat, I really appreciate you all engaging there. Uh, switch it to panelists and attendees so everybody can hear you, unless you just want to say something to us. I guess you could leave it to just panelists if you want, but I am enjoying that. Um, let's see, a couple questions in here. Real quick, this is- Yeah, go ahead, was, go ahead. I was out at the Wastewater Treatment Center um, and I was getting some spectrum grabs and I was like noticing this raised on the, this, um, noise floor. And I didn't think about it at the time, but I was next to a control room that controlled these big air jets that generated all this air out in the influx of the water treatment facility, um, and the giant pond that I was right next to. And then it disappeared. And then it came back. And it didn't, at, at, the, at the time, it took me a few minutes to realize this was the cycling, um, this is more EMI noise floor interference from the motor that was driving the fans that were injecting the air in, into the uh, wastewater treatment. And so it was cycled on for a long time and it kicked up that noise floor, then it cycled off, then it cycled on, and then it cycled off. And these were short, you know, you could see uh, these were only a minute or two minute cycles. Um, I just, again, thought that was interesting. And then out of nowhere, there was a burst of transmission. And that's what I was trying to figure out where that came from. Uh, and then it disappeared. And so I'm thinking this was some sort of timed IOT uh, uh, transmission. And because when it transmitted, it ate it up. But when it, you know, but then after it would just disappear and be gone. It was really interesting. Classic noise floor up and down. Yep. So then we get into, let's see. All right, so now we are going to go to, this is one of my favorites. I did some work at, um, I'm just gonna let this run. I did some work at an industrial ceramics facility. And you might ask, industrial ceramics, what's that? Uh, or you might not care, whatever. It's the place where they make the ceramic inserts for catalytic converters. And so the process, they have these gigantic extruders that then squirt out the um, cat catalytic converter inserts, almost like a tube of toothpaste. Well, then it goes on a conveyor from that to a toothpaste into a drying system. Um, and you know, as this progresses, anybody who's got a fair amount of experience playing with spectrum analysis, you start seeing this, this little sweeping signatures here off to the side. And, and Joel and I have talked about this before, but those sweeping signatures, and you can just kind of see that nice curl out there. Um, that's, that's pretty much indicative of microwave. So when I, they were complaining about uh, their Wi-Fi access in this one section over by the extruders and the dryers. And they had four dryers and I was standing right next to, let's see what, uh, the, right in between dryers three and four. Um, dryers one, two, and three were all brand new dryers. Dryer four was actually imported from Japan um, a, a long time ago. So it was one of their original dryers that they had. Um, and these were microwave dryers, all right? And so what was happening is, no, unit number four was imported 20 plus years ago uh, from Japan, and it predated the FCC mandate of the shielding that these de devices were supposed to have. So it was grandfathered in. It did not have all the shielding in place that dryers one, two, and three had. Um, and so the end result, you can see, is just the complete obliteration of the upper end of the 2.4 spectrum uh, in that area. It was nuts. Um, what I'm not showing uh, on the network table is everything down there in one, that is every access point in that vicinity auto, auto changed all the way down to one and started creating its own interference trying to get away from this massive blob of angriness up in the upper portion of 2.4. Um, and it was, it was just really interesting. Um, this was, uh, oh gosh, probably three years ago. And it was my first experience of, of a real just spectrum destroying interferer that really wasn't allowing anything to go on. So uh, 
people have asked me, well, what is that like? How do I explain that um, to so that, you know, the layman can understand. And what I tell them is it's like, well, if you're in a driveway and you're having a conversation with somebody and you're talking um, and having a good old time, you have meaning, meaningful communication going back and forth. Well, then your neighbor pulls up on his riding lawnmower and just sits there right next to you and it's all loud and cranked up. And so now you have all this noise and you cannot talk to your friend in the driveway because you can't hear anything over this just this static noise of this lawnmower. And so you try to move away, but even then you start yelling and now you've moved away and you're yelling and you can't hear each other over your yelling. Um, so that's kind of how I, I explain it to people. But I just thought this was just an awesome representation of, of looking and finding just crazy interference sources in a manufacturing facility. That's awesome. Now, one thing I'm noticing here, the little tails on the side here. Now, um, we didn't talk about what this graph means. This one's called the waterfall graph for anybody that's not familiar with spectrum analysis. It shows us what's happening over a period of time and color tells us amplitude, how loud is something. Uh, so it's useful for seeing like what something does over a period of time. When I've looked at like, you know, your standard household microwave a few times, and sometimes you see those little tails like that. And I always thought that those little tails were either a reflector inside the microwave that is spinning to, to more evenly distribute the RF around inside the, the microwave chamber. Um, or I have wondered if it's the actual food sitting on the turntable rotating around causing reflections or causing some kind of frequency drift or something like that. I've never I been sure. It, I would think it would be more the metallic fan that's in there causing that kind of reflection than it would yeah. be the, the food, um, I, you know, but why would it change the frequency? Because that's what we see is like a frequency drift. I don't know. That's what's weird to me. So if anybody could knows it, about microwaves, Jim, do you have something to input could it there? Be the magnetron inside of it, charging and discharging Very as, well. it, as it goes through a cycle. Because I mean, if you've ever run a microwave, especially on a defrost cycle or something like that for a while, you know, it'll, it, that magnetron spins up and down. Mm, and, I think you're right. And yeah, I didn't even you know, think about that. that's awesome. <laughs> way back in way back in the day, I have a license back there for a ship's radar endorsement on my FCC commercial license and understanding magnetrons and how they worked and stuff like that, especially in microwaves was, was something I had to learn and then completely forget as soon as I passed the test. But I would think it has something to do with the magnetron spinning up and down. The real you know, RF what's, guys what's start funny, talking. What's <laughs> funny is the, the actual manufacturer of this particular dryer, the, the name of that unit of that unit is a magnetron. When I when I when I was researching the uh, the actual that that particular piece of equipment, um, it, it's it's name designation from the manufacturer was Magnetron. Uh, <laughs> I want to say Magnetron four thousand or some crazy stuff like that. Nice. Um, hey, yeah. if I was gonna name if I was gonna name a, mic a microwave, I would totally name it the Magnetron, Magnetron. four thousand. Sounds like a transformer. <laughs> yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna top out with. Uh, the, the craziest thing that I have seen um, in uh, 2.4, I was going to do a couple to lead up to it, but since we're, I, I don't know, do you, do you think I should lead up to it, Joel? Do we have the time? Depends on how impressive they are. Like, I'll leave it up to you. We got, we, we supposedly have three minutes left. So, but uh, supposedly. Right, we'll, we'll, we'll go quick. I was at a, I was at a, right. a, a roofing manufacturing facility. They made uh, rubber, rubber roofing and they made, um, uh, they also made um, insulation board. And so I was on one side of the facility and I was just getting, I was seeing a real just heavy, heavy amount um, of, of just blaring out um, signal. Now this kind of has the overall outline, but kind of not, um, you know, it's pretty solid. You, you got some of your kind of tri peaks going on. Um, but then this one had four. I, I wasn't quite sure. It looked a lot like the signature for cameras. So I was asking everybody if they had wireless cameras here and there. A lot of facilities have cameras in general for QA checks, um, not just for security. Um, and so that, that was on completely on one side of the facility. So I was, I was beginning to get concerned because this facility brought me in because again, their Wi-Fi just was terrible and not working. Um, so then I got to another machine um, closer to the middle of the facility and it was just blowing up. And I was like, I must be, if these are cameras, I'm, I'm uh, some sort of camera system. I must be, you know, closing in on it. Um, 
but it was also cycling and it was really odd because you can see where you have and then it cycles up to even more uh, and then you can actually see where the cycle ends but it's still maintaining uh some kind of whoop, some kind of odd uh interference and again i live over here on this left side most of the time so um it, that's where i tend to be pointing when i'm talking um and so it was really, really weird. So I've, I've crossed this, this 400,000 square foot facility. The, uh, the first one I was on one side, I'm about, about halfway through and it's just getting larger and larger um, till finally I get next to, and what's funny is I get actually get next to one of the smallest production lines in the building. And it just absolutely blows my mind what I ran into. Um, complete, uh, you know, I said destruction before, but this is complete annihilation of any sort of communication ability in 2.4, but not only 2.4, because if you look at this nice, pretty wave that we've got going on here, it's reaching down into 2.3 and it's spreading up into 2.5. And it is just complete annihilation of that segment of, of wireless spectrum. I can't, I can't even say 2.4 because it's enveloping 2.3 and 2.5 too. Um, I was absolutely, I had, I don't know, I've been, I've been doing wireless work for 15 years. Um, I got into more spectrum analysis stuff probably five, six years ago. And I really gotten heavy into it in the industrial um, over the past few years but I have never, me personally, seen anything that just completely annihilates the uh, across the entire board. And so what it turned out to be is this, uh, this machine that does, uh, that, that cures the adhesive on the back of, of uh, uh, strips of insulation. So, and it uses, um, uh, infrared so it's an ir curing machine but in the process of doing it the 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 actual devices that generate the infrared also generate this brain crushing amount of emi hang um, on like literal brain crushing i mean literal brain crushing i mean i, I thought i thought i would my you ever seen scanners and the guy's heads just start bleeding before they explode um it, it, it's that that kind of and it's it's just absolutely nuts and so when I did some research, the name of the device is called a light hammer. So, uh, you know, I was like, oh, that's kind of threatening there. Um, but again, it's an older machine um, that was brought in. Now the light hammer, I don't think, I don't think that series was Japanese. So I'm not sure, uh, I, I didn't really get too terribly far into it on where it actually came from. Um, but, you know, the, the UV that it emits uh, for the curing process, that's completely outside of, of any sort of RF interference. But I'll be damned if, if what is the, the mechanical parts that are used to generate the, uh, the UV is just crazy. So about, we were able to, to get everything under control and we actually just shifted their entire workforce over to five gig and don't have a single problem because their five gig was clean as a whistle. Um, and but about two months later, they told me they were able to find an old manual for this thing. And it actually stated in the manual that it emitted RMI in the equivalent frequencies of 2.3, 2.4, and 2.5. But nobody read the book until I was, you know, all this happened. That's amazing. <laughs> that is just absolutely 2.4 gigahertz crushing. Uh, it's the people that say the 2.4 gigahertz is dead. Uh, I would say that in, in this environment with this, this thing running. It was dead. It was Yeah, gone. it's dead. Oh, it yeah. Uh, who said he's dead, Jim? Somebody said that in the chat. <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe, whatever. No, that's am <laughs> I, that is amazing. All those, I mean, the fact that the red streaks and then even, so just to the left of the channel six marker on there, you know, in that, in that middle section right there over time, where it's just that blue line. I mean, that is amazing to see. I've never seen anything like that before. And yeah, to minus 30, holy Moses. I mean, it's way up there. It's yeah, absolutely insane. That, 
I took screenshots of this because this is this is an amazing look. I've never seen this. Well, Jim, I'll, I'd be happy to to send you a copy of the WizX file. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean, it just and 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 again, I don't run across you know things of this magnitude very often. But when I do, man, it, it you know when I say that was that was a mind blowing moment for me when I when I found that. That is amazing. And there's no, I mean, what was, there's no fix for this. The no, fix is the, well, five I mean, gigahertz. That's the fix, right? Or the get a new machine. To five gigahertz. Cause otherwise they would have had to spend probably the, to the tune of three or $400,000 of, of uh, putting a big shielded box around this device and actually making it harder to use, thus lowering their efficiency. And that's one thing that you want to do is make that manufacturing line un, uh, inefficient. You and, know, between Jim and UC, they, they should be able to sell you $300,000 worth of APs to fix this problem any day of the week, right? Absolutely. No problem. So, you know, more APs cranked up at full power <laughs> is, is, is the answer to everything. No. Okay. We're ending the webinar right now. Thanks for joining everybody. Today. Uh, bye. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for that, Scott. Is there any, any more examples or was that the, uh, was that, that the was, crescendo? This, this was the, this was the, 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 the the big uh the peak the, this was the peak this was the the finale you know awesome uh, i figured between i mean this one and the one from the industrial uh uh, uh ceramics facility I, I just thought were absolutely amazing yeah you know? i agree because uh, how often do you run across something like that hardly ever <laughs> and, and then you know when you do you got to make sure you got to make sure you get those recordings so you can share it with everybody absolutely all right well if, if you don't know to look for it that's another problem you know so well now we now we have a better idea of what to look for when we're in all of those uh, those industrial environments right. so thank you so much scott really appreciate this this look, is fantastic the light hammer the light <laughs> hammer the light hammer you know? yeah so apparently it must be nordic in 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 uh in origin yeah yeah that's that's pretty epic. You, I think UC approved. He he was going. He was saying something about light hammers in, in the chat. So UC, what do you think of the light hammer? I think it's pronounced light hammer. <laughs> like nice, love it. These right. these examples, Scott, like like blown my mind. This is one of easily one of the best webinars I've been in a long long time. Really really good demos and well explained. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I, I love this stuff. And, and, you know, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try and keep finding the best samples that I can, because I really want to build my library. And then so that we can put these out there, because if you don't see it, you don't share it, people aren't going to learn. And I, I'm yep. a huge, I'm a huge, huge advocate of, of, of sharing your knowledge so that everybody can, can benefit on that so that we make the whole community better. Um, and that, you know, we all, everybody here knows that, that wireless is, is the future of everything. And the, the more we can figure this out and work together and share this knowledge, the better it's going to be for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, Scott. Really appreciate it. So one thing I want to do really quick is actually want to put up a poll really fast. Um, let's see, how do I, oh, did the poll go away? I had a poll. Casey, do you remember we did the 900X poll? We got that ready and I was going to make, I was going to. Where, yeah. where did it go? The poll's gone. We need Jerry. I need Jerry here to help me with like using zoom. <laughs> okay. I, can I just make one really quick? Oh man. I don't know if we're going to be able to pull or this off. If, oh, if I did not yes, make that no fun. Thing. If it's a yes, no thing, you can just have people raise their hands or something. Okay. If they say yes. Or Here's what or we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. Tell me how much you would pay for a Y spy 900 X. Put it in the chat. How much would you pay for a Y spy 900 X? Just, uh, just put it in there. Nobody's, nobody's willing to pay anything. Thirty dollars, said Sean. I, yeah, I think two hundred dollars. Would you, Casey? Do you remember what the price of the nine hundred X was? Was it two ninety nine? I can't remember. I wasn't working for MediGeek when if we it comes with those. those. If it comes with the light hammers, three hundred dollars. Richard still has his nine hundred, two ninety nine, two twenty nine from Keith. Awesome. Okay, One dollar, Bob. One dollar. Mike, Mike won it. One dollar, Bob. <laughs> we'll keep putting those in there, but let's let's go ahead and move towards wrapping things up. So let me just share my screen really quick. Uh, oh shoot! Don't don't look at that. Oh no! Get he is, he is not a cat. I can't get it off my screen. Uh, okay, uh, okay, now it's gone. Let me find my. Oh, don't look at that either. Oh oh man, uh, don't look at that. 
<sighs> wow, I just really messed up the webinar. I might get fired for that. We'll, we'll see what happens. Casey, please don't fire me. Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, Casey, do we have any questions left over that, that we need to uh, that we need to get answered here? Um, I think we got most Real of them. Quick. Yeah, I think I think a lot of them got answered via text really quick. Oh, one thing I'm going to ask everybody to do. Um, GPA is working on building up their kind of like their marketing stuff. And so uh, if uh, if you're on Twitter and you really should be on Twitter, uh, go follow G underscore P underscore automation, uh, GP automation on Twitter. And uh, that'll give them a little bit of a boost. Maybe go look them up on LinkedIn. Yeah, uh, we yeah. really we're, we're trying to get over a thousand people on LinkedIn. You know, awesome. Small potato to be to guys like MetaGeek and to guys like UC. But, you know, we're, we're trying to, to, to get above that uh, thousand mark. Awesome. Well, yeah, if, uh, if you want to go give them a follow over on LinkedIn, I think that helped them out a lot. Scott, thank you so much for joining us for, uh, for the webinar today. We really, really appreciate it. And everybody that joined in, it was, this was a lot of fun. Jim, thank you for being here and giving your color commentary and stuff the whole time. That was yeah, a lot thanks, of fun. Jim. Um, and uh, UC, thanks for uh, washing your car, yeah, I thanks. guess. You know what, UC, I'm going to sleep better tonight knowing that, that your car is spotless. <laughs> well done, guys. Thank you so much for well, Joel. Me. Thanks for having me on and, le and let me share all this. I had a great time. Um, maybe after I get some more, we can do it again. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and then just sit there and, and make make fun of UC some more. Oh, that sounds awesome. Let's definitely do that again soon. So awesome. Okay. Well, I think we did get all the questions answered in the chat. I think uh, I think Jim answered a bunch of them. Casey, I think you answered a bunch in there too. So thanks, guys, for doing that. Uh, well, I actually lost the chat itself. I don't know where that went, but. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Rick says, don't fire Joel. Thank you, Rick. I really do appreciate that. So awesome. Next time, um, maybe we'll talk about packet analysis on the next webinar. I do have some exciting things to share. We're a few months out, but mm, things are things are <laughs> happening. So, um, you know, think things involving things. I'll just leave it at that. So I can neither confirm nor that, deny that things are that's happening. That's not ambiguous so. at all. Right? Not ambiguous at all. So, but yeah, I am, I am really, really excited about some of the developments that we've got coming up here. And we will do a webinar for announcements and cool stuff like that. So keep an eye out. And uh, yeah, I think that's all for now. So thanks for being here, everybody. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you on a future MetaGeek webinar. Bye now.